Psalm 100. So if you turn in your Bibles uh, to Psalm 100, we're going to be looking at this psalm. Uh, the topic, as you can see uh, in your uh, order of worship, is making a joyful noise to the Lord. And uh, the Lord did have to say joyful, didn't he? The joyful noise. And so I want us to kind of walk through this psalm and glean from it. What does it mean to make a joyful noise to the Lord? And how do we do that? And why do we do that? So before we read God's word, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time of worship, the blessings you have already given to us. We look forward now to the reading and teaching of your word. Instruct us from your word by the Holy Spirit, giving us understanding of this particular passage and what it means to each of us as your children. And I pray for each one here, uh, Father, that your children would be strengthened and encouraged in their relationship with you. And should there be anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, that through the explanation of the psalm and the gospel of Jesus Christ, they would come to know him. And all glory be ascribed to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Psalm 100, a very familiar psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, brothers and sisters, let's look at this. Let's look at that first phrase. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Now, how do you make that? How do you make a joyful noise? And let's go a little bit deeper on this. Why do we make a joyful noise? Why are you and I here today? Is it because we're, it's Sunday? And this is what we do on Sunday? Or is it because of our commitment to Christ and our love for Him and His love for me and you? You see the verb there, make a noise? It's causative, which means when God says make a joyful noise, because this verb is causative, what's causing us to make a joyful noise? What's causing us to gather here at this particular time every Lord's Day to worship? And there's a difference between a routine and a habit and a commitment. We're believers in Christ. I trust each of you know Jesus as your Savior. And that commitment means I want to love him. I want to serve him. I want to obey him. And so making a joyful noise means that you and I take time to reflect on the Lord and who he is. How he's chosen us. How he has worked and is working in us providing for us on a daily basis. That should cause us to gather each day and each Lord's day to worship him and to make that joyful noise. And we all have made that. Now, if I wanted to empty this out real quick, all I gotta do is sing a few notes and those doors would fly open and y'all would be gone. But together, because of God pouring his love into our hearts, to him, we make that joyful noise to him. Because we're worshiping him, we're honoring him. And so when the psalmist says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, it's because of our relationship with Christ and our personal daily relationship with him. Experiencing his love on a daily basis, experiencing his mercy and his grace, his provision for us, and yes, experiencing his discipline. 
my parents used to tell me, this hurts me more than it's going to hurt you. And in my mind, I would say, oh, yeah. But I knew not to say that. I didn't, that, that switch, boy, that, that thing was tough. But I am who I am today, partially because of those beatings, out of those whippings I got, which I don't think parents today do that. Only grandparents want to do it, but know not to. I, I better move on. I'm getting deeper and deeper in here. So we make a joyful noise to the Lord. Now, look at the one to whom we make the joyful noise to, the Lord, Yahweh. Whenever you see the name Lord in Scripture, and it's all uppercase letters, it's Yahweh, the immutable God, who never changes in His being and in His relationship to His people. <coughs> this is very important to understand that, that God is the same every day. He has His eternal decree. He has His plan for you and me. You and I change. He does it. And I'm so thankful he does it because I can trust him. I can depend on him in any given circumstance, regardless of what it is. And as a result of that, we make a joyful noise. And notice that our joy, this noise that we make, is directed to the Lord. You know, uh, we want to impress people. And that's okay. We press them and, you know, encourage them in some form or fashion. But ultimately, we really want to impress the Lord. We want the joy of our salvation to lift up. Whenever you and I do some, something for someone, isn't it gratifying when they deeply appreciate it and they express that to you? Thank you so much. And they say it, and you and I do the same thing. We say it in a fashion in our hearts that they really mean it. You know, sometimes we say, thanks. Well, it doesn't sound like you really care for that, but we don't say that because we're nice. We're in the South. I'll move on. I'm getting in trouble again. But, you know, when someone expresses thanksgiving and joy and appreciation, it's encouraging to us. When we express joy and thanks and praise to our Heavenly Father, it causes Him joy because He knows we really appreciate who he is and what he's doing for us and what he has done for us. So we make a joyful noise to the Lord. And then notice that last phrase there, all the earth. Now, there are two ways to look at this, and I believe both of them are biblical. First of all, of all the earth refers, the earth refers not to the dirt, or the creation, it refers to all human beings. All human beings. So the first way we would, we would understand this, it refers to Christians around the world. In whatever nation, whatever country they're in, they are to praise the Lord just as we have praised the Lord. So all of God's people should lift their hearts in praise and adoration with thanksgiving to the Lord. Now let me get you to think about this. How about the non-believer? Are they not going to be held accountable for their lives as well? Aren't they going to stand before God someday? Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 14. In Romans, chapter 14, Paul is addressing uh, the issue of being judged by folks, and uh, he gives them a, a little instruction on we shouldn't be passing judgment on anyone. And look at Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. 
So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Believer and non-believer will stand before God someday and give an account for their life. How they, the non-believer, how they didn't believe in God, they didn't trust in Him, they did their own thing. And then the believer, when we stand before God, we're forgiven. We're forgiven. We're going to have a judgment of works, the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. When you read that, notice it's the works that are going to burn, not the person. The person that's going to burn is the non-believer. He's going, he or she will be cast into the lake of fire to burn forever. That's the judgment of God on those who are not believers. That is sad. That is so sad. But for those of us who are believers, our works are going to be judged. And some of the things you and I think we've done pretty well, <laughs> and some of the things that we didn't think mounted to much, that's going to be gold, silver, and precious stone. But God's the one that calls that, not us. But you and I who are in Christ will never be judged. That's why we make a joyful noise that we're not going to be judged. So that's verse 1. Now let's continue on. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Serve the Lord with gladness. The word serve there has a, a dual connotation. First of all, it means serve him. And, and it serve him in the gifts that he's given to you. All of us have different gifts and abilities. I had the privilege of, of serving in the Air Force. And um, I made, they, they uh, I passed a test that said I'd make a good mechanic. So they made an aircraft mechanic out of me. I am not a mechanic, by the way. I'll just be, t I'll just tell you, I'm not a mechanic. I learned how to do it, and I did it well. But I worked with some men who were mechanics. They understood. It would take me 30 minutes to do a job. It would take them 10, 15. They were mechanics. But in that occupation, we're to serve the Lord in using the gifts and abilities Whatever gift and ability each of you have, music, beautiful, we're blessed by it. Accountants, businessmen, painters, plumbers, whatever you do, God-given gift, and we're to do that. You remember studying about the Puritans in school and how they believed that their work that they did with their hands was an act of worship? This is where they got it out of that word serve now that also means the word serve in this context also means to um, participate in formal worship as what we've done this morning I heard every one of you singing see how we sound together I'm thankful for our dear brother Edie there because he's got a good voice booms out we follow you thank the Lord for you brother and for all of us as we lift our voices with praise and thanksgiving to God it's a joyful noise to him and he loves it and this is what we're supposed to do so serving the Lord is serving him with gladness and that's another word we need to look at gladness is great joy or pleasure and this gladness is a heartfelt response to God and who he is and what he's done for us. Again, when someone does something good for us, helps us out, does it spontaneously sometimes, <laughs> we should have heartfelt thanks and, and joy that they love us so much that they helped us out in that situation. 
And what do we do in return? We thank them and we help them out. But we also should thank the Lord for bringing them into our lives. And so we give a joyful thanks to God for that person being in our lives because God has brought him or her in our lives. So we serve the Lord with gladness. We come into his presence with thanksgiving. Notice we come. We come to him. He's all, he lives in us by the spirit, but there are times he draws us to him. But we come to him. I'm going to use the Air Force again because the second morning that I was in basic training, we were falling out of the uh, barracks and somehow or another, I ended up in the number one slot. The DI was standing next to me. He called cadence after me. Well, we marched a little ways and I got out of step. And uh, it, it, he got upset. <laughs> and he came up to me. I was still in civilian clothes. We were marching to get our uniform that day. And he picked me up by my shirt. And he got, y'all remember Gomer Pyle, that nose to nose? He got that close to me. I was in his presence. Now, I'm, I, I'm not going to tell you what he said. But he literally turned me this way and threw me on the ground and said, I don't want to see your ugly face the rest of the day. And they marched off. And I'm lying on the, floor, on the, on the pavement. And I'm thinking, I don't know where I am. I better keep up with them. And I ran. He was here, and I was over here. And I stayed there the rest of the day. Being in the presence of God is being in his face. That word, presence, is the word, Hebrew word, pane, which means in your face. In your face. How often do you and I get into the face of God, get that close to him? Taking time during the day and days are so busy but taking time during the day to get in a place that's still and quiet turning off our cell phones by the way I better turn this thing off turning off our cell phones and getting still and quiet before the Lord and pouring our heart out to him and then sitting there and let him speak to you by his spirit. Just sit there and meditate. Think. And he will speak. But if all I do is pray and I get up and I'm going to the next thing I need to do, how can I hear him? And we say as believers, God doesn't answer my prayer. Are you listening? Do you see him working in you? Are you paying attention? And so we see here, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Joyful noise, singing. I love singing by myself. And I love singing with brothers and sisters in Christ. There's something that's spiritually uplifting and encouraging when all of our voices can be heard. Mary Ellen and I worship at Redeemer Community Church, and we always sit in the balcony uh, up there. And about two or three Sundays ago, uh, we were singing, and, and uh, the, the band was playing, and the band was loud. And, uh, but in the next song, the band didn't play as loud. And I could hear all the voices singing around me up in that balcony. And I could hear a few down. It was awesome. It was like being in heaven in a choir. I stopped singing just to listen to them. It was so encouraging and uplifting. We need to sing together and praise God together and make that joyful noise 
every time we're in a worship service. And so we come together in his presence singing. Now, the next step, uh, so we serve the Lord. We make a joyful noise to him in our serving. Now, look at the next uh, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now, let's look at this verse 3. Know that the Lord is good. The verb to know means to possess knowledge. And whom are we to know? The Lord, Yahweh. How well do you and I know the Lord? What is our knowledge of him? Where do you get your understanding of God? Please tell me it's from the scripture and not from music. I mean, some music is good, solid music, what we have sung this morning. But some, some words, I, I question them. They're not biblically sound. They sound good. But are they biblical truth? But we're to know the Lord. Have that knowledge, that specific information from him. What are we to know? That the Lord is God. Now we have two names. The Lord, Yahweh. I've already mentioned him. Immutable God who never changes in his being or in his relationship with his people. The Lord is God. Now, God can be translated from two Hebrew words. One is El, which is translated God like it is here. And it means powerful, sovereign owner. He's a powerful God. He's a sovereign God. He owns everything and everybody, which means he owns each one of us, especially in Christ. You ever thought about being owned by God? Wow. Ponder that this afternoon. The other Hebrew word is Elohim. It's the plural of El. And it emphasizes the omnipotence of God. That's Elohim in this psalm. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth the powerful God in this world when some of these leaders and nations think they're top dog and they got all the power and all the money they're nothing God can snuff them out in a heartbeat and they'll stand before him someday in all of his glory and majesty and holiness. As we will too. But there's a difference there. If we have Jesus as our savior. We know him. And he knows us. And look at the next line. The Lord he is God. He who has made us. The verb to make there. Has the same connotation. As God created the heavens and earth, bringing something out of nothing. God created us. Now, go over to Psalm 139. Go over to Psalm 139. And I want us to look, first of all, at verse 13. David is writing about who God is. And notice in 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Think about that. All of us have had basic biology and how uh, the, the woman conceives from the man. It's a man and a woman. It's the way God created us. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And we have a tendency to think in our medical field, everything just begins to develop and comes together. But we read here, God is the one that's actually putting us together. You got to complain about who you are and take it, to, take it upstairs. 
God formed you. God made you. God gave you your mother and your daddy, and they had you, and you're here. It's all a working of God. And we're told here that He created us, He formed us, He made us. Now, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. There is another birth that you and I have. Everybody that's born into this world since Genesis chapter 3 is born spiritually dead. I mean, that, that little baby that is so precious. Your children there. Wow, see them come in this morning. Awesome. They're precious. They're precious. All children are precious. And all children are spiritually dead. They need Jesus as their Savior. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And my dear brothers and sisters, are we seeing that so strongly today? The spiritual deadness in this world, and in particular this country. We don't need legislation and laws. We need Christ. And we need to be talking to people about Christ. Now, let's go on down in chapter 2 to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Every human being is spiritually dead until they come to know Jesus Christ and receive Jesus as Savior, and then we're born again. We're spiritually born. Now, look at verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. The word workmanship means product. Now think about this. Have you ever bought a product that wasn't worth a flip? Didn't work. Got home and tried to use a thing. Throw it in a trash can. Piece of junk. I won't buy that again. You and I in Christ are a product of God. How God has worked in us, brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life. God has given you and me abilities to use those gifts to honor Him. And to use those gifts when we use them. And people say, well, why are you doing that? Well, they've just opened the door for you to share the gospel with them. And to show God's love to them by helping them out. And notice here it says, You were his workmanship created for in Christ Jesus for good works. The way you and I live our lives out every day is because that's why God created you and me is to do these works. And notice he goes on to say, Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, when you think about the sovereignty of God and the immutability of God and the eternal decree of God, He's got it all worked out. All we have to do is listen and focus on Him and do what He wants us to do. Uh, when I was in being in the Air Force, they 
they, I, I was okay, you know, I, the, my plane didn't crash and, and it, it did fine. It functioned well. And when I went to uh, Thailand during Vietnam, the Air Force, um, I worked on never crashed, thank the Lord for that. They functioned well. And God had that plan for me to do all that. I thought I was making the decision because I was uh, not a Christian when I'm, uh, yeah, I was a Christian when I went over there, but I wasn't a Christian when I went in the Air Force. And I thought I was learning all this stuff and doing all this and all along it was God giving me the ability. But boy, when he woke me up spiritually, I thought, trucks, you're just a piece of meat. God's working in you. And you know when he stops working in you and me? You know when he stops using us? When he calls us home. So until that time, you and I should make a joyful noise to the Lord and see how he's working in us and see how he's using us and knowing our responsibility is to listen to him. So he gives us physical life. He gives us spiritual life. And then, this is awesome. He lives in us by his spirit. I don't couldn't tell you how many times I've prayed, Lord, I'm so sorry. Holy Spirit, I'm sorry you're living in this garbage can. I mess it up so much. It stinks pretty badly sometimes. I'm so sorry. Forgive me of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, you know, just go through it. And you know what? When we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can rejoice then. Now, let's keep on going. I need to finish this sermon sometime today. <laughs> Look at verse 4. We're exhorted here. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Entering into the gates, refer to entering into the gates of the temple. Entering into the courts would be entering into the courts of the temple where the people of God would come and worship. This is not the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest would go in there one time a year. But now you and I in Christ, we live in the presence of God. We're not limited to access to him. We're there all the time. And notice that when we come into his presence, what do we do? We give thanks. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you're doing in me. And notice this last thing. We bless his name. Now, how can the finite, the weak, bless the infinite, the holy? Bless there translates to honor, to give him honor, to give him praise. Because he's the one that's doing it through us. He's, we're the instrument in his hand. And you are his instrument. You are his child. And he's gifted each of us. And he's using you. And you and I need to just be aware of that. And any other way he might choose to use us. And then we honor him as we're being used by him. In verse 5, the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Yahweh is good. It means morally excellent. The best. His steadfast love endures forever. The steadfast love of God. He's loyal to his covenant promises to us in Christ. He's not going to promise one thing and never give it to us. He doesn't do that. He doesn't break promises. His faithfulness to all generations. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah 29, the children of Israel have been taken into captivity. And they're in Babylon. And the, and, and the Lord tells uh, Jeremiah to write this letter to them. A letter of encouragement. 
And now, so realize, they're in a, they have lost their country. Their temple has been destroyed. There's a remnant left in, in Israel. But the bulk of them are in, uh, in Babylon under a pagan king. Why did, they, why did God do that? Disobedience. That's a whooping and a half. And they paid for it for 70 years. But as they had just arrived in Babylon and were beginning to settle in, they received this letter from Jeremiah, chapter 29. I'm just going to read parts of it. Look at verse 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. Listen to this. Well, I'm going to start in 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. We're in difficult times right now as a nation. But God is faithful to his people. This is a promise to us. Now turn over to chapter 31. Verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with the fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying know the Lord for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more the word iniquity means sin and guilt when we're forgiven, God not only forgives the sin, the thought, the word, the deed, he forgives the guilt. And when you and I pray, according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you and I confess it, receive his forgiveness, you are forgiven forgiven the guilt is gone and this is how you and I live Jeremiah is the only prophet that prophesies about the new covenant now we go forward to the night that Jesus was betrayed and he was up in the upper room with the disciples they would had the Passover and he took the bread This bread is my body. Take, eat. It is given for you. Then he took the cup. This cup is my blood, which is shed for many. Drink all of it. For as often as you eat this bread, 
and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You and I are recipients of that new covenant in Christ. You see how faithful God was to his own children when he disciplined them and put them in Babylon. And 70 years later, he brought them back. He's immutable. He never changes in his being and his relationship with his people. And in this psalm, we're told in verse 5, his faithfulness to all generations, which means you and me and everyone else who trusts in Jesus Christ up to the second coming of Christ. That's the hope that you and I have. Times are bleak, yeah, but Jesus is our Savior. We have that hope. And my dear brothers and sisters, sisters, think on this. When Jesus returns, how long are we going to be in heaven in eternity? Forever. It will never end. I hope and pray each of you know Jesus is your Savior. And this is the hope that we have. This is why you and I make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth. Keep making that joyful noise. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, I'd like to talk to you and share the gospel with you. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we praise your holy and majestic name. Thank you for what you've taught us today from your word. Encourage us, strengthen us. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sin and help us to continue to lead our lives in a way that pleases and honor you and help us to make that joyful noise to you and to bless and praise your holy and majestic name. And I ask all this in Jesus' name.